What is up, YouTube universe? It is Salvo the Stack. I am back with episode six of Sports, All Sports, and Nothing But Sports. Today, I wanted to switch it up a little bit, and I wanted to talk about the infamous GOAT, okay, the greatest of all time. This is a debate that rages on everywhere from homes to bar stools to stadiums to gymnasiums, uh, the internet, anywhere you have sports fans that gather, tailgating parties, they're going to argue about, well, who is the greatest of all time? And Everybody has a different opinion as opposed to who they think the greatest of all time is. And you could look at stats, you could look at impact, you could look at championships. There's a lot of different ways I think people judge who their favorite player is or who their opinion is about who their favorite player is. Obviously, if you're a big fan of a particular team, you're going to think, well, that player uh, who played for your team is the greatest of all time. So, I mean, if you're a Patriot fan, you might say Tom Brady. I mean, if you're a Yankee fan, you could say Babe Ruth. I mean, if you're a Steelers fan, you could say Terry Bradshaw or you could say... Uh, ben Roethlisberger, you know, if you're a Pirates fan, you can say Roberto Clemente. So it depends on, I think, the city you grew up in. It depends on what team you root for. And so I love the debate with the GOAT because, like I said, everybody has a different opinion. But you can kind of see how they judge or what their so-called criteria is for who they think is the best player of all time. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the GOAT today. Now that LeBron James is unfortunately lost in the first round with the Lakers, everyone's like, oh, his legacy is legacy. But you know what? I was like, LeBron has... Uh, appeared in 10 NBA Finals, and he's got four championships. So I think his legacy is pretty safe. Uh, if he plays a couple more years, he might even break the uh, all-time scoring record held by Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. So I don't think uh, LeBron is too worried about his legacy right now. Uh, he's you know, obviously a great player, and you know I think it's unfair that people want to compare every other player in the world to Michael Jordan. And I think it's kind of an, an unfair comparison just because everybody's a different player in their own right. But uh, I don't want to jump ahead. We'll, we'll get to that a little bit later in the episode. Uh, but I wanted to start off um, just by mentioning a couple other sports, uh, just because I think, you know, everybody could say who they think is the greatest of all time. Is uh, The first one I like to say is golf. Um, if you're a golf fan, you could say Jack Nicholas is the greatest of all time because he has 18 majors. Uh, you could say Tiger Woods because he has 15. You could say Arnold Palmer. You could say Phil Mickelson. You could say Ben Hogan. Um, you could, you know, Tom Kite. There's a lot of different, uh, Greg Norman, you know, a lot of different um, golf golfers throughout the years who you can maybe make an argument uh, for the greatest of all time but I think if you mention Tiger Woods, Jack Nicholas, or Arnold Palmer I don't think you can go wrong I think that's kind of personal preference um, I like to say the same thing for tennis as well obviously tennis and golf are both individual sports so if you look at uh, the world of tennis you could say you know uh, Federer you could say Nadal you could say Sampras you could say McEnroe you could say Bjorn Borg, Yvonne Lendl, Andre Agassi uh, if you're talking women's tennis, you could say Venus Williams, Serena Williams. Uh, you could say Steffi Graf. You could pick pretty much, you know, a million different people. Well, maybe not a million, but you can pick a lot of different tennis players out of a hat and make an argument that they're the greatest of all time. You know, you have Martina Navratilova. You have Steffi. Uh, I'm sorry. You have uh, Chris Everett. You know, Billie Jean King had an influence in tennis. So I think uh, you could definitely, you know, put up a fight and pick your favorite player and argue that they're the greatest of all time. Uh, the next sport I want to go to are more of the team sports. Uh, the first one is baseball. Uh, the greatest baseball player of all time, well, I mean, I think you could certainly debate that, but, you know, is it a position player? Is it a pitcher? Uh, if you go by pitchers, you know, is Cy Young the greatest pitcher because he had 511 wins? Um, is Babe Ruth the greatest uh, batter because he, you know, hit 714 home runs? Uh, is Ty Cobb the greatest because he had the highest batting average and the second most hits? You know, is it Willie Mays? Is it Hank Aaron? Uh, is it Mike Trout? You know, is it cheater Barry Bonds you know so uh, baseball is great just because you have different positions you have different uh, types of players if you go by championships in baseball does that make Yogi Berra the greatest because he has 10 rings you know does that make Joe DiMaggio the best player because he had nine rings so I think you can kind of argue uh, who the best uh, player is in baseball but I think you'd have to say who the best batter is and who the best pitcher is just because of of the different uh, positions that they play so uh, it makes it definitely for a live argument. You know, do you include the steroid um, players in that greatest of all time discussion? You know, is Mark McGuire up there as one of the greatest home run hitters of all times? But, you know, you know, he used steroids. Is it, you know, uh, like I said, Barry Bonds? Is it Rafael Palmeiro, Sammy Sosa? Uh, you know, some people could say Ken Griffey Jr. was the greatest ball player of all time just because, uh, you know, the so-called five-tool player. So I think you can make an argument for a lot of different players. But I think if you went with Babe Ruth, It'd be kind of tough to argue because he was such a, a great player. And, you know, if a little people remember that he was actually a great pitcher first before he switched over full-time to offense. So if you say Babe Ruth, I don't think he can go wrong. Uh, the next sport I wanted to mention is hockey. Uh, just because I think um, if you look at the hockey numbers and statistics, I think you could pick uh, the greatest player of all time. And 
put up a little resistance from other people. And of course, I'm talking about the great one, uh, Wayne Gretzky. Uh, when Gretzky came into the league as an 18-year-old rookie back in 1979, I don't know if anybody thought he would have the career he did, but the guy was just flat out unbelievable to watch. Uh, I am old enough to see, uh, be able to see Wayne Gretzky play. And, you know, I got to see him in his heyday. And this was back when hockey wasn't the most popular sport. It wasn't on TV a ton. And so it was kind of tough to watch him play. You know, you got to see him on Sports Center night, the highlights. Uh, you got to see him play in the playoffs on national TV. But it's not like uh, New York had, you know, regularly scheduled Edmonton Oilers games. And so, but just to watch this guy play, I mean, it was almost like, you know, they hear that expression, poetry, emotion. And that was Wayne Gretzky when you watched him play on the ice. Uh, just to start off, he was a four-time Stanley Cup winner. Uh, they won four titles in five years, the Edmonton Oilers. Um, he won eight straight MVP awards. I mean, just let that sink in for a second. Eight straight years, he was the most valuable player in the NHL. I mean, that's just, I mean, could you even imagine someone doing that today in any sport? I mean, it's just unbelievable. Uh, he won nine MVPs in 10 years. Mario Lemieux uh, ended his run of eight straight. And then Gretzky was voted MVP the year after. Uh, he was a 10-time award winner of the Art Russ Trophy, which is most points, you know, goals and assists combined. And he was the only player in the NHL history to have 200 points or more in a season, which is goals combined with assists. And he did it four times, and not even not even one player did it once. Uh, Lemieux came close. He had 199 one season. But, I mean, Gretzky was just unbelievable. Uh, he's first all-time in goals with 894. Uh, Alec Ovechkin is second with 730. Uh, Ovechkin's in his mid to late 30s now. Um, he's starting to slow down a little bit. So, I mean, if he plays long enough, he might break the record. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, Wayne Gretzky holds the record for most uh, goals in a season with 92 back in 1982. Uh, nowadays, we think, oh, a guy scores 30, 35, 40 goals. He's a goal scorer. But, I mean, Gretzky scored 92 goals in a season. I mean, that's more than a goal a game, which is unbelievable. Uh, if you look at career assists, uh, Wayne Gretzky has 1,963 assists. Uh, if you look at the current NHL leader, uh, Joe Thornton, who I believe still is still playing. I don't know if he's retired yet. He has 1,104. So he's basically 800 assists behind Wayne Gretzky. And Joe Thornton, I think, has played over 20 years. So he would have to play another career just to catch up to Wayne Gretzky. Uh, Gretzky led the league in assists 13 straight years from 1979 to 1992. I mean, that's just unbelievable. Uh, he has the record for most assists in a season with 163. And the top 10 assist seasons in the NHL, Wayne Gretzky has 10 of them. I mean, the guy was just unbelievable to watch. He was, without a doubt, uh, a point machine. Uh, total points for a career, uh, Gretzky's all-time record of 2,857. Uh, second place is Yaramir Yager, the great uh, player for the Pittsburgh Penguins. He has 1,921. So he's basically 900 points behind Wayne Gretzky all time. Uh, active leader, if he's still if he's still going to play, is Joe Thornton. He has 1,529. So Joe Thornton's played over 20 years, and he still is a little more than halfway to Wayne Gretzky's point total. So I mean, when you look at just the sheer numbers, Gretzky was just head and shoulders above everybody else. And I mean, obviously it helped. He played on the Edmonton Oilers, which were championship teams. But to watch him play was just. It was really, it was really a treat. You know, he was just, I think, head and shoulders above everybody else in the NHL. And I don't know if you'll ever see another player quite like him. You know, hockey's obviously evolved over the last 40 years, but I think you could say Wayne Gretzky is definitely the greatest of all time. Next, it brings me to the NFL. Uh, the NFL obviously uh, has had some great players over the years. Um, you look at Tom Brady with his seven Super Bowl rings. Uh, you look at Drew Brees, you look at Peyton Manning, you look at people like Jim Brown, who played in a different era, obviously, in the 50s and 60s. Uh, you look at Walter Payton. You know, uh, on defense, you have people like Lawrence Taylor, Reggie White, uh, Ray Lewis. Uh, you know, you have Jerry Rice, you have Joe Montana. I mean, you've just had so many different great NFL players over the years that, you know, it might be kind of hard for you to pick just one guy out and say, well, he's the greatest of all time. But if I had a vote or, in my opinion, I would pick – None other than Mr. Wide Receiver Jerry Rice. Okay, Jerry Rice to me was the greatest NFL player ever. And if you look at his numbers, uh, once again, similar to Wayne Gretzky, he is just head and shoulders above other wide receivers um, to play in the NFL. And first thing to remember is when uh, Jerry Rice came into the league in 1985, uh, you didn't see um, teams throwing the ball every down. They weren't as pass happy as they are now. Uh, the rules were a little bit different. 
Uh, you can actually hit a quarterback. You can actually, you know, put your hands on a wide receiver. So I think he played in an era where the defense is a little bit tougher just because they didn't call as many penalties and let defensive players get away with a little bit more. Uh, Jerry Rice came out of college, uh, Mississippi Valley State, a first-round pick by Bill Walsh and the 49ers. I did not have 4-3 speed. You know, we didn't, like, you know, uh, he wasn't your prototypical uh, wide receiver from a big school with great combine numbers. But they saw something, obviously, that nobody else saw because once he got into the league, Jerry Rice took off and he just never looked back. And so just to kind of put that in perspective about how great Jerry Rice was, uh, in 1985, Jerry Rice's rookie year, uh, teams averaged 515 pass attempts in a season, okay? In 2004, when Jerry Rice retired, it was 511 pass attempts in a season. So it went down a little bit in the 20 years that he played. If you look at 2020, the average pass attempts for a team is 563. So about 50 more passes now in 2020 than when Jerry Rice retired. So obviously the NFL is more of a pass-friendly league now. Teams throw the ball, you know, anywhere from 30 to 50 times in a game. So if you look at Jerry Rice's quarterbacks, obviously he had two of the best. He had Joe Montana, he had Steve Young. But it wasn't like uh, Patrick Mahomes or Aaron Rodgers today where these guys threw the ball every down, okay? Uh, Joe Montana's 49ers, a couple of seasons of the league in rushing. So they were obviously running the ball as well as passing. And if you look at Joe Montana from 1986 to 1989, those four seasons, he threw less than 400 passes each year. So it wasn't like Jerry Rice was just catching the ball every single down, okay? Uh, When Steve Rice was, uh, I'm sorry, when Steve Young was a starter, it was a little bit better. He was eight years as a starter, but he only threw 500 passes in a season once. So Jerry Rice was playing with quarterbacks who weren't even meeting the, the, uh, the team average as far as pass attempts go. So you think, well, he's going to have less less opportunities to catch the ball than if his quarterbacks aren't throwing the ball as much. Um, so if you look at 1987, okay, that was the strike year. Uh, Jerry Rice had 65 catches. He had 1,078 yards. He averaged 16.6 yards per catch, and he scored an NFL record 22 touchdowns, and he only played in 12 games. So that was almost two touchdown catches a game, which is unheard of. Uh, when Randy Moss broke his touchdowns in a season record in 2007, obviously that was the 18-year-old season of the Patriots who got beat by the Giants, my Giants. Uh, Randy Moss had 98 catches, 1,493 yards, 15 yards a catch, and he had 23 touchdowns. So he broke Jerry Rice's touchdown record by one. But as you can see, he played in four more games, and if you look at the pass attempts that year, Joe Montana threw 398 passes in 1987. And Tom Brady, when he set the record with Randy Moss, he threw 578 passes. So, Jerry Rice's record was broken even though Randy Moss had 33 more catches and Tom Brady threw 180 more passes than Joe Montana did. So, to me, that's what tells me what Jerry Rice did was all the more impressive because one out of every three of his catches went for a touchdown. And, I mean, if you put that in today's game where guys catch 100 passes in a season, you'd have a guy catching 33 touchdowns passes in a season. That would be just would blow the record out of the water. Okay, so what Jerry Rice did in that year, I think was just incredible. And the fact that Randy Moss needed four extra games, you know, to break that record just shows you how incredible that record was. So if we look at Jerry Rice's legacy, you know, obviously he has uh, a couple of Super Bowl wins with the Niners. Um, I believe he had... Uh, three rings overall. Uh, his records, or all-time records, he's first in receptions, 1,549. Um, second place is Larry Fitzgerald, who right now it looks like he's leaning towards retirement because he's a free agent and he hasn't signed with anyone yet. So he had 1,432, so he was about 100, 117 catches behind. So if he plays another couple seasons, maybe he would break that record. Okay. Now the next active player, if you don't count Larry Fitzgerald, the active leader in catches is Antonio Brown with 886. So Jerry Rice almost has double as many catches as Antonio Brown does. Uh, Jerry Rice is also first in receiving yards with 22,895. Second place is Larry Fitzgerald with 17,492. So Jerry Rice has 5,000 more <laughs> career uh, receiving yards than Larry Fitzgerald has. Um, if Fitzgerald stays retired or if he does retire, uh, the, the active leader among players right now is Julio Jones with 12,896. So, I mean, he's not even close uh, to Jerry Rice. Um, your first uh, all-time receiving touchdowns, 197, Jerry Rice. Second place, Randy Moss, 156. 
Uh, if Fitzgerald stays retired, the active leader in touchdown catches is uh, Rob Gronkowski with 86. So he's not even in the same stratosphere as Jerry Rice. Um, and he's also the first all-time in touchdowns with 197. Second is Emmett Smith with 175. Um, he's also first all-time in games played by a wide receiver, 303. And Larry Fitzgerald, the second with 263. And it was one season with Jerry Rice towards ACL, so he basically played in one game that year. But the guy just had incredible um, staying power. You know, he hardly ever got hurt. He pretty much always played 16 games in a season. And so I think, you know, that longevity is why his records are so good. But, I mean, if you look at his overall body of work, I mean, he is just so head and shoulders above all, of, all other wide receivers. And like I said, he played in an era where teams ran the ball a lot more and didn't pass the ball as much as they do today. So I think most of his records are pretty safe. Uh, just to put it in some perspective, when Jerry Rice was age 40 years old, he caught 92 passes. I mean, you don't even see wide receivers play in the NFL today who are nine, uh, 40 years old. And he caught 92 passes when he was 40 years old. So I think that just kind of gives you an idea of how great Jerry Rice actually was. So I think, in my opinion, Jerry Rice, greatest NFL player of all time. Now, the last one, the NBA. Uh, throughout the years, you've seen some great NBA players. Um, just to name a few, you have Magic Johnson, you have Larry Bird, who was you know, credited with saving the NBA in the 80s. Uh, you have Michael Jordan, you have Bill Russell, you have Walt Chamberlain, you have Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, you have LeBron James, you have Kobe Bryant, you have Tim Duncan. I mean, the list just goes on and on and on about how many great players uh, the NBA has had. And so when people talk about the greatest of all time, they always want to compare Kobe and LeBron to Magic, uh, to Michael. You know, Michael did this, Michael did that. He never lost in the finals. He won six titles. But Michael, um, for as great as he was, first off, he played a different position than, um, you know, Biggs. You know, he was a, obviously a two guard. So to compare him to a power forward or a center, I think it's a little misleading because you know, Michael could play point. He could bring the ball up if he wanted to. So the ball was always in his hands. Okay, when you have somebody posted up down low like a Tim Duncan or a Kareem or Will Chamberlain, they basically have to depend on their point guard to get them the ball. So right away, the guards, I think, are going to have an advantage just because they're handling the ball all the time. And, you know, one of the knocks on Magic Johnson is, well, he didn't score a whole lot of points. But, you know, he didn't have to score a whole lot of points. When you're passing the ball to James Worthy and to Byron Scott and to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and, you know, some of the other great players he played with, uh, you don't need to score 25 or 30 points a game. You know, he was a point guard. His job is to dish the ball out and set up his teammates. So I think that's an unfair mark or, you know, criticism of Magic Johnson because, I mean, the guy could average a triple-double every game if he wanted to, just like, you know, Byron uh, Westbrook does now. But the fact that he didn't have to score as much, I think, you know, when people say greatest of all time, you know, Magic Johnson's not one of the first guys they think of. But to be a 6'9 point guard and play the way he did, I mean, he was a truly unique player and I think, you know, top 10 greatest of all time. But what I would like to do here today is make the argument for the greatest NBA player of all time. And I do not believe that it is Michael Jordan. I think you can make the argument that Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is the greatest NBA player of all time and maybe even the greatest basketball player who ever played. And so if we look at Kareem and Jordan and just kind of compare their careers, okay, um, First thing is, they both had six rings, okay? Kareem won five titles with the Lakers. He won one with the Bucks. Jordan obviously won his six titles with the Bulls. Then he retired, and then he played a couple more seasons. Um, if you look at all-time scoring, uh, Kareem is number one. He played, uh, he scored 38,387 points. Uh, Jordan is fifth all-time now with 32,292. Uh, Kareem won six most valuable player awards in his career. Jordan won five MVPs. Uh, Kareem was voted to 19 All-Star Games. Jordan was voted to 15, uh, I'm sorry, 14 All-Star Games. Kareem was voted 11 times All-Defense Team. Uh, Jordan was voted 9 times All-Defense Team. Uh, Jabbar was a 2 times Final MVP. Jordan was a 6 time Finals MVP. Uh, Kareem was voted Rookie of the Year in 1970. Jordan was voted Rookie of the Year in 1985. Uh, Kareem was a 2 time Scoring Champion. Jordan was a 10 time Scoring Champion. Uh, Kareem was uh, led the league in blocks four times. Jordan led the, steals, uh, the, the league in steals three times. Obviously different positions. You can't expect Jordan to lead the league in blocks or Kareem to lead the league in steals. Uh, Kareem was voted 15 times All-NBA. Uh, Jordan was voted 11 times All-NBA. So they both had obviously great success. They both had a lot of accolades and awards. Um, if you look at Kareem in his, uh, the year he turned 38, uh, 
When he was a 38-year-old playing in the NBA, he averaged 23.4 points a game, and he shot 56% from the floor. Obviously, uh, developing the sky hook, which I'll mention in a little bit, uh, pretty much most unstoppable shot in uh, basketball. You know, you just can't block it when the guy's 7'2", and he's shooting a sky hook over you. I'm sure many have tried, but none have been able to do it. So you could say his percentage was high because he played obviously played around the basket. Uh, when Michael was a 38-year-old with the uh, Washington Wizards, he averaged 22.9 points per game, but he only shot 41%. If he rounded off 42%, so obviously he was starting to slow down. Uh, his field goal percentage wasn't as good. Uh, if you look at their careers in the playoffs, uh, Kareem averaged 24 points a game in the playoffs, 10 and a half rebounds. Uh, Michael averaged 33 points in the playoffs, six rebounds, and five assists. Now, if you look at field goal attempts over their career, okay, throughout his career, uh, Kareem took 28,307 shots in a 20-year career. Michael, I believe, played 15 years. He took 24,537 shots. Uh, Kareem led the NBA one year in field goal attempts. Uh, Michael Jordan led the NBA nine times in field goal attempts. So obviously, uh, Michael took, you know, a lot of shots in the time that he played. And, you know, obviously, when you're the leading scorer, you are going to take more shots, okay? So uh, if we look at their college careers, uh, Kareem won 88-2 and two in college. He played from 67 to 69 for UCLA, and they won the championship each year he was there. Um, Michael won 88 games in college as well. He had 13 losses, and he did win a national championship his freshman year when he had James Worthy and Sam Perkins and that great Carolina team that beat Kentucky. I'm sorry, they beat Georgetown and Patrick Ewing. Uh, Kareem was voted the NCAA MVP all three years. They won the title, and both players were Naismith Award winners, which is recognized as the best player in college basketball. Now, the difference there is Kareem was so dominant in college that when he got to UCLA as a freshman in 1965, um, the freshman couldn't play on the varsity team, so he had to play on the JV team. And so at the time, UCLA was coming off back-to-back NCAA championships. So when they would practice, the varsity would routinely lose to the JV team because of Kareem, because he was such a great player. So you had the defending national champions who were the best team in the country, and they were the second-best team on their campus. <laughs> okay? Uh, it's just unbelievable to think that you know Kareem lost a year of college because of the rules. And then when he did get to play varsity in 1967, Obviously, uh, UCLA won, won the championship, and the NCAA uh, outlawed dunking after Kareem's sophomore year because they felt that it was taking away from the game, which, let's face it, that's basically saying um, black players are becoming better than white players, so we're going to take away dunking because a lot of the black players dunk. I mean, that's basically what it was. I mean, you can argue until you blew in the face. Um, 1966 also saw um, Texas Western, which is University of Texas, El Paso, they won the championship in 1966 with an all-black starting five, and they beat an all-white starting five in Kentucky in Adolph Rupp. So I think the NCAA was trying to penalize the black athletes because they were starting to have a lot more success. And so they outlawed dunking, and it didn't affect Kareem one bit. He still went on to win two more titles. He developed a sky hook because of the ban on dunking, and the NCAA finally took the ban off of dunking in the mid-'70s. And so you never saw Julius Irving dunk in a college game. You never saw... Um, Billy Thompson dunk. Uh, so it was just, I think, a ridiculous rule to put in. And it was obviously, I think, a racist rule as well. But when you look at overall, the body of work for Kareem and the body of work for Michael Jordan, I think you could definitely make the case that Kareem was just as good, if not better, uh, than Michael Jordan was and that he was the GOAT, uh, the greatest of all time. Uh, when they change the rules in college because you're such a dominant player, I think that definitely tells you that you're doing something right. And so... You know, I never got, obviously, a chance to play, uh, to watch Kareem play in college, but I'm sure it was just amazing to watch, you know, a seven-footer who had agility and who could move around and run the court. I mean, it was kind of unlike anything people had ever seen. And the fact that uh, Kareem started to play against seven-footers uh, during his career, you know, he had people um, at least as big as him. I mean, if you go back and look at some of the video, Will Chamberlain, I mean, this poor guy was in college. He was seven feet tall, and teams would play zone defense and basically quadruple team him. <laughs> I mean, you would have guys, three or four guys on Wilt at one time. But he also noticed, too, a lot of the guys back then were 6'5", 6'6", 6'7". I mean, you didn't see anybody who were really seven-footers back when Wilt started playing. And so he scored all those points despite all these double and triple teams. Okay, And even when Wilt Chamberlain got to the NBA, you know, Bill Russell considered one of the greatest uh, defenders all time. 
But if you look at the numbers when Bill Russell played Will Chamberlain, Chamberlain would routinely drop 40 points on the poor guy. But since the Celtics were a better team, a lot of times, you know, Russell would end up beating Chamberlain. But as far as individual numbers go, I mean, Chamberlain was just, I think, head and shoulders above Bill Walton. and You know, I'm sorry, Bill Russell. And Bill Russell was more of a defensive player. But when people say, oh, he's great just to have to play it, but, you know, like I said, whatever Will Chamberlain played against him, but basically kind of did what he wanted. <laughs> so that is my episode for today. Uh, I would love to hear you guys drop a comment or, you know, um, start a discussion as opposed to who you think is the greatest of all time. Don't let me know if you agree or disagree with my choices. But, uh, you know, sometimes I say the numbers don't lie, and I think on my choices, I feel pretty good about them. And I would love to know what you guys think or who your choice is for your uh, greatest players of all time. So, like I said, I'd love to hear from you guys. Leave a comment or leave a post and let me know what you think. Okay? Until next episode, take care, guys.